Wait, what? I gotta try this out tonight. Whoa, game yeah. changer. And I told my mom, sell my horses. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Oh, it's not that bad. Or you, you can make it or just be positive. And I'm like, man, that is not real life. If I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it with everything I've got. And I wanna be the best at it. I think, don't quote me on that kind of stuff, but I think that that's what the- You're on record is. now, Amberly. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Everyone's gonna come back at me someday for what happened. Hello and welcome back to Redirected. I'm your host, Andrew East, and this is a show where we sit down with celebrities, athletes, entrepreneurs, really anybody who has had a significant pivot in life. I call these pivots redirections, and we all encounter them at one time or another. And so I wanted to sit down with people who have gone through these pivots well in order to learn something and share that knowledge with you. Today, we have a delightful show. We sit down with Amber Lee Snyder, who you may recognize from the Netflix piece called Walk, Ride, Rodeo. And Amber Lee walks us through how she went from being at the peak of her career, a world champion horseback rider, to ultimately ending up in a wheelchair. She has some wonderful words of wisdom to share with you guys based off what she learned in that experience. And if you haven't yet, I would love for you to subscribe and rate the show. I love five-star ratings, so you can go ahead and drop that down below. But if you want to find out more about Amber Lee, you can find her in the show notes down below. And let's go ahead and just jump right into it. Amber Lee, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. It's good to meet you. Good to meet you. Thank you for having me on. I believe you are from my favorite state in the United States of America, Utah. I didn't know that was your favorite state, but I yes, that's where I'm from. What part of the state are you from? Uh, my parents are in Elk Ridge, so they're kind of like an hour south of Salt Lake City, pretty central. I just bought a house. I shouldn't say just, it's been a year, but I bought a house. <laughs> In Tremont in Utah, so an hour north of Salt Lake City. Awesome. So I, uh, Sean and I, my wife, took a little road trip in southern Utah. We went to Moab and did all the national parks. It is so beautiful. It doesn't get enough credit, I don't think. I don't think so either. Yeah, you go down there to Moab and it is beautiful down there. Uh, we went mountain biking and just had a ball. Is Did you go to see the arches and everything too? Yes. Amazing. It was so cool. Canyonlands is like right there. There's a couple of national parks and it's like, if you guys, you know, if you haven't been, you got to check it out for sure. I agree. I um, agree. I would love to hear about your upbringing. What are your parents like? It sounds like they were um, into the rodeo scene as well, but uh, you have a brother, I believe. Uh, there's six kids of us. Actually, there's a whole bunch of us. Oh my gosh. Yes. And I have been really lucky with the family I've been raised into. So my dad was a major league baseball player for eight and a half years. Mm -hmm. So, of course, when us kids were born, we were destined to be successful in whatever we were supposed to be in. <laughs> um, I think it was like not a choice. So he he did that, which, of course, obviously impacted the what we did and how well we did it. And then my mom, she was a cheerleader when she was younger. She was a gymnast and she rode horses. So honestly, a few of us kids took a little bit of all of that. And uh, I took the horse side but my mom is the reason that I we're so tough really like she was the cheerleader in any moment for us when we had hard times to remember you know that we're we're important and we're capable of what we want to do and to not give up regardless of what the challenge is whether it's in a sport or out that's great I uh, I don't know why but I view cheerleading and and um rodeo on two opposite ends of the spectrum so she she must be like a renaissance woman hats off to her she did a little bit of everything. Yeah. Which is pretty incredible. Where are you in the lineup of the six kids? I am second. So I have an older sister than me and two little brothers and two little sisters. Oh my gosh. Full house right there. I'm in the middle of fives. So you guys got to stop. But um, yeah, I, I know how it is being second, second oldest. I know how you're, you're, you know, a little spoiled maybe, but uh I think that goes with the baby. If you're the <laughs> husband, that's the most spoiled. Are yours? Are yours siblings boys or girls? Or do I, you got, call them? I have three brothers and one sister. So. so the sister is the special one in yours. Yeah, she is the princess. You don't want to mess with her, um, or else we're coming after you. Um, I believe so, that. So you got into horse riding in what age three? Is that right? Three, and I probably would have started younger if I could have. But three is when we finally found a place that would take me to teach me how to ride. And then they literally throw you on a horse at that young of age? Yeah, definitely. What? That's crazy. 
Well, I just think if it's in your blood, I mean, you feel like you've belonged there forever. And I was, well, I'm not even sure I rode a horse at one. I remember, well, that's not sure. I don't even remember, but I have pictures of at my one-year-old birthday party. My parents got those ponies that you could walk in circles and they came to the house and I was falling asleep on the back actually, because I was so comfortable being there. So that's a day of pictures of my first birthday falling asleep on the back of a pony. Wow, that's amazing. I have I have one story of me on a horse when I was about eight years old. So my aunt and uncle are big into horses and they have a farm. And so when I was eight, they put me on a horse and it was like they said the best behaved horse they'd ever have, but it bucked when I was on it. And I like hung on and my uncle thought it was just epic that I like, you know, was riding this bucking horse and um it was that's that's my cowboy story. That's all I got. I, I met that's it. That was the only time. <laughs> yeah. that, was that was the end. Yeah, that that was uh, the pinnacle of it. Um, I would love for you to walk us through um, your horse, your rodeo career up until 2009, if you don't mind. Okay. So for me, the rodeo aspect started when I was seven, when we moved to Utah. I had told my dad I'd only move if he bought me a Palomino barrel horse when we got there. So like a golden barrel horse. Whoa. So he bought me one. And that's when I started competing in rodeo through the junior days. Um, you know, and did well, honestly, everywhere I went, buckles, saddles, awards, all of the above did really well into high school. And, uh, my senior year was 2009. And in 2009, I made the national high school finals as well as the national little britches finals where I left with a world all around title. So, I mean, really for me, my rodeo career was, was what you dream of having happen. You know, you start young and you literally jump right into being successful and winning, which is what we all want to do regardless of what we do. And I was able to do that. And even, you know, up into my senior year to make the high school finals, which every kid wants to do, and then end with a world title, which is also what you want to do. So I was pretty happy with the way it went. A world title. That is insane. Um, out of curiosity, what other nations compete with the U.S.? Like as far as who would be the, the second best horse riding country behind the U.S.? Man, um, I mean, you'll, you'll get some, a lot of Canadians will come down okay. to both of those national rodeos. And then you get some from Australia. Whoa. They will come. And like on occasion you get Brazil, but those, that's not going to, those are going to be rough stock riders. So I'm not going to be competing against those, but there's a quite a few really tough people from Canada. that will actually come and rodeo with us. There we go. I did not know that. I learned something new today. Your event, your main events were pole bending and breakaway riding. Is that right? And b- there is braille racing. Well, so I did four events. I did braille racing, pole bending, goat tying, and breakaway roping. Okay. But my best one was pole bending. Okay. And then, but probably my favorite one was breakaway roping. And now I don't do either. I just braille race. Describe pole bending to me and other listeners who don't know what that is. Okay, so there's six poles that are set up in the arena and they're 21 feet apart. And you run down one side, weave through them, weave back through them, and then run home. So you're doing that in about 20, you know, 20 seconds is what was going to be a good time to be doing that. Just hanging out for dear life or what? How do you? Pretty, pretty much. Like you, I mean, and that's a lot of obstacles that you can hit. So yeah, yeah you want to just make sure that your timing is perfect in order to, to do well at that. Is it fair to say that it's the slalom racing of horseback riding? Yeah. I don't think I've ever even heard that of a saying, but yeah, it would be. I mean, there's poles out there and you have to be weaving in and out of them as fast as you can. So that would work. I just made that up. I'd never seen that, but it's from what I've watched, it kind of looks like what it's, what it's comparable to. Right. Um, That makes sense. So you're 2009, just like reaching all your goals, crushing it. And then in January, 2010, can you tell us that story? Yes. January 10th of 2010, I was on my way to Denver, Colorado for the stock show. I was going there to just work. I didn't have horses with me, but I uh, stopped in Sinclair. Well, I stopped in Rollins, Wyoming at a gas station. And when I got back in my truck, I didn't put my seatbelt back on. I'd had a stomach ache that whole morning. Hmm. Not knowing that less than 10 miles down the road going through Sinclair, Wyoming, my life would completely change. 
So while I was going through Sinclair, I looked down to check my map. When I looked up, I'd faded over a lane and was heading towards one of those beams on the side of the road. I overcorrected, which resulted in my truck rolling and me being ejected, hitting a fence post at 70 miles an hour across my stomach, which is what broke my back and injured my spinal cord. And you are a senior in high school at this point? I had just graduated. So I graduated in 2009. So it was that next, that next, I don't know what you say, winter, spring, however that works. Describe to me what the next three months were like. Oh, well, I mean, you can even start with sitting on the side of the road, right? Waiting for somebody to come and find me. I didn't get knocked out during the whole thing. So, I mean, I remember everything. Like I remember feeling my truck pick up off the ground. I remember leaving through my window. I remember hitting a fence post. I remember, I mean, you sit there, right? And you think through what just happened. And then you realize your legs, you can't feel them. And so for me, like in that moment, it's like, okay, so what do I do now? Right? Like I have to, how am I going to, I was a state FFA president in Utah at the time. So I'm thinking, how do I finish that? I know I still have jobs to do there. How am I going to ride my horses? I mean, you just kind of think through how you're going to do everything, but it feels surreal. Mm. So honestly, I felt like that for quite some time. I mean, they told me in the hospital, I was the chances of moving or feeling my legs was slim to none. Um, but more than none, then, you know, fast forward 10 days, I start therapy and 10 days after the accident. Started. Yes. 10 days after was when I started physical therapy, which was tough. Um, but they wanted, I mean, they wanted to jump right in and which was great. I mean, I'm glad that we did. It was, it was hard. Everything that you feel like you've built, like this balance that you have or this strength you think you have is completely different. I mean, all those things that you relied on, you no longer can rely on. So I did six weeks of inpatient physical therapy and then they sent me home and I did another, I don't know how many months of physical therapy before I went to school that fall. There's a lot of testing that went into that. I mean, a lot of days that seem fine. And then a lot of days that you cry a lot, a lot of days that you are really pissed off. Um, I mean, all of the above that goes into that. Wow. Was there, you mentioned there's a lot of emotions that go with it, but was there kind of a general trajectory that your emotions took you on? Was it like fear to sadness to, you know, excitement or? I feel like... I got mad more often than any other emotion, hmm. to be honest. I mean, even, I think even still when things are not going the way that I want them to go, I get rather frustrated and angry about it more than I do sad, which is okay because I think that it's a, honestly a higher energy emotion. Um, but I think, I mean, I don't know, like, let me like think back through in the hospital. And at first, like you go through all the stages of grief, right? You think it's not real. Like you kind of deny this is how it's going to go. And then I don't even know all the stages, but you get upset and then you're frustrated and you want to reason that this isn't going to stay like this. It has to change. It has to get better. And then you finally just go, okay, this is what it is for right now. So what can I do? Amazing mentality to have. And I don't think um I don't think everybody would be able to reach that point. I mean, you you mentioned you go to you go back to school that fall and then I believe it's a year and a half later that you're back competing again after this tragic accident. Like I, I wanna get back or I want I, I wanna touch on what that was like when you ultimately competed, but I do wanna ask, was there ever a point where you felt like you were teeter tottering between like I mean you could so easily go down the poor me path. I'm done with this. Like, and your life could in a lot of ways kind of end at that point or take the route you did and, and say, you know what, what, what can we do? Let's do the best. Let's, let's, let's crush it. You know, was there ever a point where you felt like you had to walk that line? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, multiple times. It's not even like it was just once and then it never happens again. But multiple times, I mean, it was that first summer 
after my accident, that was the first summer that I hadn't been on a horse every day Mm -hmm. since I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And here I am, I turned 19 in the hospital. So here I am at 19 and I don't even know what to do with every day. Like there was a, there was a stage there where I thought if I could sleep in the latest I possibly can in the day, it's less of the day for me to handle. Mm -hmm. So between honestly, my mom would let my dog into my room and she would come and sit on my wheelchair until I would get out of bed. So which she now won't sit on my wheelchair. I know she was there for a purpose at that point. So she would make me get out of bed just to do something. And then my brothers were both in high school playing baseball and they would, every single game, I would be at every single game, whether it was home or away. And I I think that's how I survived, which I did ride that first summer. The first time I rode was four months after. So that day was was one of those days, right? So I got back on that horse for the first time and I realized it was never going to be the same. And I just thought, well, then this is it. Like, I don't even know who I am because if I can't ride my horses, then what am I? That's one of those moments of, I just, and I'm not even saying I didn't wallow for a minute. Of course I did. I was really upset. And then it's like, okay, but now what? So then we got the seatbelt put on the saddle and we tried that. And then I went through all of those up and downs through that summer. I did stop for nine months. So that was in August when I did go to school. And I told my mom, sell my horses. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I don't think I really meant that. But in my mind, I felt like I needed to say it. And I went nine months without them. And then I got back on that next spring and have never looked back. And when you said you're done, was that out of frustration? Like, uh, this just doesn't feel the same? I don't. Like yes. That. Yes, definitely out of, I didn't know how I was going to be as competitive, right? I don't, if I'm going to do something, I don't want to be mediocre at it. Hmm. And I thought I'm never going to be able to be the best at this anymore. So if I can't be the best at it, then what am I doing it for? Has that mentality changed? No, (laughs) I don't think so at all. Because I, I mean, heck, I just ran a real race this weekend. And I won the first day and hit a barrel to be second, the second day that's against everyone else that's able-bodied. So absolutely not. That hasn't changed. I'm like that with speaking. I'm like that with anything. If I'm, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it with everything I've got. And I want to be the best at it. You reminded me, my grandpa always used to say, whatever you do, do it with such excellence that you'd be proud to sign your name to it. And it seems like you live by a similar philosophy. Um, which is amazing. I'm, I'm so impressed uh, just by not even how you dealt with this specific situation, but it seems like your mentality in life is to be very solution oriented or um, you mentioned like, Hey, yeah, you, you did wallow for a second, but immediately you're like, okay, well, what can we do to make this better? Let's put a seatbelt on. Um, And it's not, there's not, this marinating in the problems, it's more like, well, what can we do next to make this better? And I think that having that mentality is like, I'm, I got the chills over here just because it's, it's amazing. And it's, it's a rare find. I'm curious, was there ever, um, was there anything tangible that you did? Like any books that you read or any groups that you were part of or uh, anything you did on a daily basis to help you overcome that wallowing that you mentioned? You know, I, I would, I, you wouldn't believe how many people give you books. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to yeah. Fix where you're at. Um, and I'm like, honestly, just barely reading them and we're nine years later, but I was rather hard headed and stubborn. I'm like, okay, my answers are not in that freaking book. So I'm not going to read that today. Hmm. My mom did that a lot. Um, for me, a lot, my family helped a lot in the sense that they allowed me to be frustrated. Hmm. You know, they allowed me to get upset. They allowed me to be sad. They allowed me to say things to them that I shouldn't have said because, and I think because of that, it was like I could get it out and then move forward. I don't know. I'm really faith oriented as well. And I, swear anytime I was like, okay, God, this is not fair. And this is not okay. He would remind me in one sense or another, like, don't worry. Like I got your back. 
I'm going to get that figured out for you. And honestly, that was what turned me around with my horses. I went on a deer hunt and this deer showed up because I prayed for it. And I was like, all right, you got my back. We're okay. Wow. wow. That's amazing. Um, I should show you. Can you even, can you see? And I oh, just like, show show. Oh, oh, you're, like show the deer. It's on your wall now. Is that what you're saying? That so, this is, so these are my deer on my wall. Holy beautiful. Those things are crazy. But the one that's on the, I don't know how to do it with camera wise, the one that's closest to the camera, he was my deer that I prayed for up there. No way. What a story. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that was one of those days. I, it was when I had quit writing and I was like, Hey God, like if you hear me and you love me and you listen to me about all this, send me this deer. And he showed up. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. If you've ever felt like there is something that interferes with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals, BetterHelp has online counseling that is there for you. BetterHelp offers licensed professional counselors who are specialized in issues such as depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, grief, self-esteem, and more. You can connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. Anything you share is confidential and it is so convenient. You can now get help at your own time and at your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist. If you are not happy with your counselor, you can request a new one at any time at no additional charge. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. Redirected listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code redirected. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash redirected. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash redirected. Hey, listen, if you run your own business, you are used to doing it all. But if you're struggling to get through your to-do list, HoneyBook can help. HoneyBook is an online business management tool that organizes your client communications, bookings, contracts, and invoices all in one place. HoneyBook makes it simple to run your business better. Professional templates, e-signatures, and built-in automation keeps everything on track and makes you look good. They can even consolidate services you already use, like QuickBooks, Google Suite, Excel, and MailChimp or Gmail. It is the number one choice for client and business management for freelancers like Sean and I and business owners. Save time and do more of what you love with HoneyBook. And right now, HoneyBook is offering our listeners 50% off when you visit honeybook.com slash east. Payment is flexible, and this promotion applies whether you pay monthly or annually. Go to honeybook.com slash east for 50% off your first year. That's honeybook.com slash E-A-S-T. Today's episode is brought to you by Away. Away gives you first-class luggage at a coach price. And their approach is simple, to create special objects that are designed to be resilient, resourceful, and essential to the way you travel today. Away uses high-quality materials while offering a much lower price compared to other brands by cutting out the middleman and selling directly to you. You can even get free shipping on any Away order within the lower 48 states. You can choose from nine different colors and four different sizes. My personal favorite is the carry-on. And some of the features that I love about Away products are that all the suitcases are made with a premium German polycarbonate, which is unrivaled in its strength and impact resistance. And the interior features a patent-pending compression system, which is helpful for you overpacking packers out there. There's a removable, washable laundry bag that keeps dirty clothes separate from the clean. And both sizes of the carry-on are able to charge all cell phones and anything else that's powered by a USB cord. There's a lifetime warranty, so if anything breaks, they will fix it or replace it for life. And a 100-day trial, so you can live with it, vibe with it, travel with it, Instagram it, and if you want to return it, you get a full refund. If you guys want $20 off your suitcase, go to awaytravel.com forward slash east and use promo code EAST during checkout. That's $20 off a suitcase at awaytravel.com forward slash east. Use promo code EAST during checkout. It seems like you found a lot of strength in like being honest with yourself and when with your situation and with your family. And it seems like that was able to really help you out. Um, can you talk about that for a little bit? Absolutely. And I, I tell people that everywhere that I go, um, because I think that we do read, you know, we read these books and we listen to these podcasts where we say, oh, it's not that bad or you, you can make it or just be positive. And I'm like, man, that is not real life. 
You yeah. cannot be positive every single day. You really can't. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to be, but it is okay to be upset. You know, it's okay to get frustrated and mad. I mean, that's why we're human. And I think that if you sit and bury those feelings for so long, eventually it's going to catch up to you. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know, for me personally, it does a lot better if I allow myself to feel them and then go, okay, take a deep breath. Now what? Yeah. Rather than just try to be like, nope, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm happy. This is okay. I don't mind this. I don't, you know, I'm happy in a wheelchair. I'm okay that I can't get on my horses by myself. Yeah. No, that's lying. It's not okay. But what can we do after that? Mm -hmm. It's helped me. It's helped me stay sane, if nothing else. Yeah. I I think it, I think it kind of piggybacks off the idea of like living in the now and like how important it is to, Hey, you're going through this. So like go through it and then you'll be able to deal with it. And that's when the growth occurs, Uh, whether it's like a good, like high in life or low in life, be there and experience that whatever emotions go with it and you'll come out on the other side stronger. Um, for doing so what was it like to be like still so you mentioned you have a brother that's playing um professional ball in the minors um your dad's this mlb player it sounds like all your whole family's athletes this happens to you um what was the was there any tension um regarding that you know i have thought a lot about that and i truly believe that there's a reason behind everything And if I had to look at all of my siblings, I'm glad that I'm the one that did this because my, I mean, my older sister was a gymnast and she's now a coach. And I just think, how could she have coached from a chair? That's just not going to work. And she loves the beach. So she can't do that from your chair. Not like you want to. I mean, you can, but not like you want to. Mm -hmm. My brothers, both are athletes. You can't play professional baseball from a chair. It's not going to work. Um, my little sister, one of my little sisters is a dance and fool. She loves that. And yeah, there's people who dance in their chair, but you're not going to do it the same. And my last little sister, she rides with me, but I would never wanted that to happen to my baby sister. So I think, I mean, of all of my siblings, heck, I'm the one that can get on a horse and have it be my legs. Never was there a a part where I thought, man, you know, this was unfair or it should have happened to someone else or, you know, I wish it wasn't me because if I had to pick between me or somebody else in my family, I'm glad I'm the one that got it. Hmm. Uh, Talk to us about how you've been able to ride again and and what that's been like in your competition career. So uh, it was like we talked about 18 months when I first got back on. And that it was tough for a bit because I wanted it to be what it was before. And I had to recognize that it was going to be a process. So the first run that I made, I was a second off of what I was before, which is pretty good. You're not winning with that, but it's pretty good. Um, and I just, I just kept working on it. Like, okay, well, if I can't kick here, like how do I get my horse to run faster here? If I can't make my horse do this, then what am I going to do in order to be successful? And it's been a process. I now have a a horse that I run that is different than the one I ran in the very beginning. His name was Power. Everyone knows Power if they've seen the movie. He's my big black horse. He's the one I got back on after after my accident. I run a horse named Legacy now. I call him Legs for short because that's what he became. And uh, he's cool. I mean, I know on his good day, it doesn't matter who shows up, he can win. And that was a process still. I mean, I had to train him to listen to me. I can't use my legs. So I have to train him to listen to my hands and listen to my voice and, and run free by himself. So that is a, is a challenge. It still is probably where I get the most frustrated is when I can't get him to do something I want to do. But I don't know, like I said, when, when you go out for the weekend and you can end up winning and then you're like, all right, we're, we're making it work. We can do this. Wow. So you mentioned your dog consoling you. And one thing that I would love to hear your input on is, uh, is it equine, equine therapy? Equine. Thank you. Equine therapy. And um, 
was that, do you feel like you being in the rodeo community around all these horses was therapeutic for you at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, I just had somebody, I ask people ask me all the time, how did you do it? I tell you family, faith, and horses. Hmm. That is why I'm still who I am. Um, I mean, horses truly have become my legs for me. It's the only time I get to ignore that my chair even exists and get to do what I want to do or be free in that sense. So there's a lot that comes from horses and people with equine therapy that they have that, gosh, it helps everyone Mm. in one sense or another. I mean, these horses are not, I, I don't know. I don't know if we take them for granted sometimes. Like, they're so special and they really can sense when they need to be a certain way for you. Um, yeah. I mean, that's definitely why I am here. What do you, what do you love so much about horses? Oh, one, they get to go fast. (laughs) (laughs) Two, they let me win. Uh, and three, they give me a lot of freedom. So all all of those things you get to, a man, when you're on a horse and you're going fast, like there's a lot of power that comes from that. We all want to feel empowered in one way or another. Mm -hmm. They give me that a lot. So you are now doing quite a lot of motivational speaking. I would love to hear um, how you got into that. And then what are your main messages that you try to convey? So I feel like motivational speaking picked me. It wasn't that one day I woke up and decided to become a speaker. Um, When I was in my accident, I was state FFA president. A part of that office is you give a retiring address when you are done, like a going away speech. I had written my speech in December of 2009. I thought that the, if there was one message left for FFA members that I wanted to share, it was that they could overcome any obstacle that was thrown their way. Oh my gosh. So I write this whole speech in December of 2009. Literally a couple of weeks later, I'm now living it. Oh my gosh. So it was three months to the day after my accident that convention started. And I was able to go out on the stage and now give a very, I guess, different kind of a speech than what I was expecting on overcoming obstacles. Um, I felt like not only was I telling them, but I was showing them. And I think showing myself at the same time. So after that, I started getting asked to speak. Um, Started at banquets and then at schools and churches and then grew to businesses. And it was probably in about 2014 that I was asked to speak out of Utah. And I thought, oh my heck, I could really do this. Like this could be my job. And I swear the second that happened, God was like, oh, finally. And I am not kidding. Like emails after emails after emails came in to have me start speaking. Hmm. And so now that's what I do traveled around and speak and get to share my story, which I love doing. Um, yeah. So that's what I do now. And you were just down in Medellin, Colombia, right? Yes. So Medi- the, the locals call it Medellin. Medellin. <laughs> uh, hey, I had no clue how to say Medellin. it until I got there and they start talking about it. And I'm like, Oh, this is where I am. Okay. Yeah. So I know you had a couple of events down there, one of which was getting a certain type of therapy. I would love for you to tell us about that. Yes. So it's a stem cell therapy. The company is called BioAccelerator. And they contacted me after my movie came out and asked if I would be interested in doing stem cell, which of course I have been. They don't have that quality of stem cell in the United States available yet. So I knew that I wanted to wait and just didn't know when or how I would get this kind of stem cell. So we lined it up and I did. I went over to Columbia and they take out some of your spinal fluid and they replace it with stem cells. Um, And then you, it's honestly, it's a waiting period at that point to see what they can heal. So it's a couple months to really feel, start feeling the impacts. You go back, I'll go back in October and I'll get it done again. And I'm excited to see what comes from that. And it works for everything. It's not just spinal cord injuries. I mean, it's MS, it's injuries, it's, it's, um, traumatic brain injuries. It's all, well, I was there. There was a, 
he's super, super famous in the soccer world. He like stopped in and got his knees done because he just felt like they were kind of achy. I was like, oh my heck, this is crazy. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. What it would it be like as an athlete to just, you know, oh, I'm a little sore, shoot me up with some stin cells, huh? For real, you can't do that here. Like that doesn't happen. Which sure they can, but it's not that quality of stem cells. It's what? they can in your own marrow and put it back in. Why is that in the U.S. that it's behind? I think it's just all the regulations and stuff that they, everything just takes so long to approve. I think, don't quote me on that kind of stuff, but I think that that's what the You're on record now, Amberly. Yeah, (laughs) great. Everyone's going to come back at me someday for what happened. So as far as expectations go with the stem cell therapy, how are your feelings with that? That's always tough. Yeah. Um, that's always tough for me because after my accident, I would always tell myself, I'm going to walk by this date. I'm going to walk by this date. I'm going to walk, you know, by here. And there's some things you don't have control over. So I don't get to pick when my nerves work. And I've, I've had a tough time with that quite a few moments. So when this opportunity came, I thought, okay, I'm going in with the most optimism I can have because I feel like that's important just to have your energy level at that sense, you know, at that space in order to heal. But I recognize that my life is great. It really is great. And this would just make it better. You know, this isn't going to be the fix. And they tell you that they tell you don't expect this to be the reason you walk, but expect it to improve the quality of your life. So I'm like, all right, I can expect that you know, I can expect to have it improve where I'm at. And that's a step in the right direction. Wow. Um, it, it does seem stem cell in general seems so exciting. We had uh, one of the guests on the show was one of my good friends, Tim Shaw, who was a professional football player for seven years and then uh, developed ALS at age like 30, which is way younger than usual. And he had to fly to Israel uh, four times five times i think one to get the initial like draw that they would ultimately make the stem cells from um but he had pretty good success with it so um, i'm excited to see how that goes with you and if nothing else you're changing lives down there in uh, columbia i saw you're meeting up with fans and that is actually you're you're on the show because i had tons of people recommend you uh that recommend you to me and um when i came across your story i was like absolutely what a what a fit and having seen your speeches and and the material you've put out it's like couldn't be more impressed so i would love for you to tell do you have a couple pieces of content called walk ride rodeo one is a netflix documentary and then another is a children's book is that right yes tell me about the netflix document documentary first well the book came first And then the movie came. Okay. I'm going to tell you about the book first. Okay. (laughs) So the book happened because, so I'm strapped into my saddle, right? When I ride, Mm -hmm. there is always a risk that my horse could fall. I get that. I'm in it for the long run. Like that's just what I know. Well, it actually happened in 2017. My horse fell at a rodeo and when he fell, he broke my femur. So of course, now they're on my summer of rodeo because now I'm laid in bed with a broken femur. I decided I can't just sit there and not do anything. So I wrote a kid's book. So it took me, well, I wrote it in two days, but then obviously it took time to like put it all together in the illustrator and all that. I am not an artist. So I had to find somebody else to do that. That's where Walk Ride Rodeo came from initially was the book. And then the movie came along And so the movie's called Walk Ride Rodeo as well. It's on Netflix. And that came through, um, uh, honestly, it was kind of a process. Producer after producer took it and we built the script. And then a second producer came along. And then right near the end of their contract, they actually told me that Netflix was involved and wanted in on it. Wow. So I said, okay, if we can make that work, then honestly, the very first time somebody came to me about the movie, I said no. I thought my family has been through enough the first time around. We don't need to have them relive this whole thing again. Hmm. My parents told me it was going to be, it was bigger than me. You know, it was, if it could help so many more people that that's what we should do. And that was why I decided to agree to the movie. So March 8th of this year is when it came out on Netflix. 
sort of crazy. I mean, wow. it still is. It's unreal to me when kids come up and ask me questions about my life. And I'm like, how do you know that? And I have to remember, oh, that's right. As you guys have seen my whole life. <laughs> That's amazing. That is so much fun. Um, okay, so you you were sensitive to your family not wanting to have them live through it, but now you're. I mean, you're giving speeches worldwide. Is do you, like is that fear gone now? I mean, in a sense, I've I've always been able to share my story, but it isn't necessarily the inside of my whole family, and I just yeah. felt like they lived it once, right? They lived me being in a chair, they lived the frustrations with me. And it was hard, really, really hard for them to, to see the accident, right? Because they recreate it for the movie. And it was one thing that I had told the story, but it was another thing to, in in essence, watch me roll my truck and fly out of a vehicle. I mean, that was really, really tough on them. I think it still is. I still don't know if they watched that scene without crying, but that was what I was worried about is I didn't want to traumatize them all again with having to do that with me. Yeah. So this show is all about people who have experienced interesting pivots. You often talk, talk about pivots and obstacles and and how to make it through that. What is your advice for people who are confronted with obstacles? The first I tell them to not compare to other people's. I think we spend a lot of our lives trying to compare and feeling like, well, if they can, uh, you know, why am I not doing what they're doing? First, don't compare. We all have our own challenges. Two, it's okay to be upset when you have them. But three, most importantly, pick what you're going to do after that. And when you, when you make those changes, I mean, dedicate to them and then celebrate along the way. I think it's so important to celebrate every tiny bit you have overcome. That's Fantastic advice. Uh, what are you celebrating recently? Curious. Well, heck, I just like I said, I just won that race on Saturday, so I was able to celebrate. So I'm a cheesy celebrator. I celebrate with stovetop s'mores. So <laughs> yeah. Wait, tell me about this. How do you make them? Oh, you just get a marshmallow on a fork and put it over the stove, and that's how you cook it. And oh, then- so you got like a gas stove? Like if I got electric, it wouldn't work the same, huh? No, mine's electric. You literally just put the marshmallow on top? Well, it'd be, I mean, you hold it like you would cook a s'more over the fire. And, and it cooks like that? Well, heck yeah, it does. Wait, hey, what? I got to try this out tonight. Whoa. Game yeah. changer. Yes. So that's my dorky. So I, I try to earn a s'more every day. So I feel like if I can do something every day to earn a s'more, then that's a good day. Yeah. So I obviously earned that for the weekend. I was able to do that. <laughs> but that, that is my life. Um, I, so I honestly, that's what I was working. I, I'm always working on that. Every rodeo to be successful. And then I, my speaking is about to be crazy. So gosh, I hope that with every speech I book, um, there's at least one person in the crowd that feels like they were meant to be there. Hmm. So I always have that when I travel. Wow. Uh, you strike me as a two marshmallow per s'more kind of gal. I actually only one, really? but I will, I usually cook one and eat it by itself and then cook one and put it with the ground. <laughs> okay. A little appetizer pre s'more. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and you put chocolate on, please tell me you put chocolate on. I, so I cook them what? with, well, I cook them with fudge stripes cookies. They're literally on my counter right here. Cause I haven't had mine yet today. You put the marshmallow between the fudge stripes? the best s'more you'll ever have in your life this is this is big news for me i'm gonna it is hey if you want to make it even crazier you add a reese's cup in between there and no, then i gotta go one step at a time and then maybe someday we'll get there <laughs> yeah <laughs> um okay so what are your goals now so for me um speaking in all 50 states i'm working on being able to do that uh, rodeo wise, making circuit finals and then eventually the national finals as well as the American. Um, walking is always a goal. Um, and I feel like that's kind of where, Oh, and I'm trying to write, I say the big kids book because I feel like we're all children at heart. So I wrote the little kids book and I'm really working on, on the big kids book and a charity. I'm working on getting a charity started. So huh. I think what that's the, probably it for right now. Well, what, um, would your charity aid? 
So my charity would be for um, pieces of freedom, right? So I feel like that, in a sense, this is, all I should, this is where I got the idea. So um, like to be able to drive again was so freeing for me. Some people don't have enough money to afford to put a set of hand controls in a car. So if I can give them that piece of freedom or having a ramp to get inside their house to have it be accessible or building a saddle that works, just any sort of those little pieces of freedom, that is what I want to be able to help. We have a friend, Brady Quinn, who is a professional uh, football player, and he has a charity that helps um, helps build handicap accessible homes or uh, yeah. wherever people f- most frequent, like he'll, he'll do that to make it wheelchair, wheelchair friendly. And it's, uh, it's kind of cool. He has going on, but um, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to sit down with me today. I, I really enjoyed getting to know you and I'm excited for what's next. Uh, it seems like it's only good things and I can't wait to follow. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. If you haven't yet, please make sure that you subscribe to the podcast and leave a review if you feel called to. Uh, It really helps the show out. And um, I love having a new audience. I love hearing what you guys think. And I love having you come back every single week. Bye.